Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we start, I would like to draw your attention to what I can offer you as a master coach. I can help you to focus on your why with clarity, uniting your passion with your purpose with a plan to create the life you truly desire. Book a free 20 minute coaching call right now via calendly.com forward slash Amy Rowlandson forward slash call and we can take it from there. Today on Focus on Why, I am joined by Charlotte Jones. Charlotte, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Amy. And where are you joining us from? I'm joining you from sunny Stratford-upon-Avon, actually, in Warwickshire. Oh, I love Stratford. It was where I grew up. It was, it's a wonderful, wonderful town. So, oh, yeah, I'm, in fact, I'll be there in a few weeks as, as I love going back. So Shakespeare himself came from there and I often quote him. So wonderful place. So what is it you're focusing on at the moment, Charlotte? I am focusing on my book that I've written and the focus is getting the word out about what people can do for themselves recovering from chronic fatigue long covid or any energy issues where they might need some guidance and help and they might be at the start of their journey they might go towards the end but this book will help a whole range of people and was there something available for people before this book There are some really good books out there on chronic fatigue. There's some really good technical books. There are um, a range of different books that you can tap into and read. My issue is when I had it, and I've had chronic fatigue twice and long COVID, is when you're in the throes of very little energy to the point that you're even struggling to read because your eye muscles are struggling. You just want something, or I just really wanted something to pick up easy to read that would give me some pointers of what I could do right now today to help myself that was not in a hard technical book that I would have to wade through to get the information and also I just wanted something fun (laughs) I wanted something that was fun and light-hearted because when you're struggling you do want a little bit of something that was going to lift you and guide you so that's the purpose of writing it. So you've essentially written the book that you wish you could have reached out for that first time and maybe even have prevented the second time. Absolutely. I would have loved this book. And I think uh, what I love about it is is written as a story. And it's a magical story. And don't we all love stories? You know, going back to times of sitting around campfires and... You know, that's how information was passed on was through stories. And I think I think we've lost a bit of storytelling. And so it's written as a story. It's a magical journey, which is unusual for something, uh, you know, as serious as sort of chronic fatigue, long COVID. But I hope it really hooks the reader in and makes them smile And they can follow the main character who's called Angela along her journey. Now, tell me, you you just cast my mind back to sitting around campfires and and passing down for generations stories. Has chronic fatigue been around for generations? Chronic fatigue has been around for a while, but it was never really accepted or appreciated or registered. It was known as yuppie flu. So when I had it nearly 30, my first experience, you know, nearly 25, 30 years ago, um, it was very much yuppie flu and it was just, you know, get on with it. Uh, You're making it up. It's all in your head. It wasn't really believed. Um, And it's come a long, long way. From the second time I had it, so eight years ago, 
it's very different. It is it is more recognised. It still isn't fully, but it certainly people are much more aware of it. And especially with long COVID, chronic fatigue has come into the forefront of people's minds because people with long COVID are left with fatigue. So I think it's it's been on a journey of its own. And it's interesting that the I wouldn't say popularity, but maybe just the high high levels of people who have suffered with long COVID, uh, that it's helped people to recognise that it does exist, that the chronic fatigue is a thing and it's not something that people make up. But because the sheer numbers of how many people at the same time in, in time have experienced long COVID, that it is given that sort of reason for supporting those people who haven't felt supported before i think that i think that's really true so is is your book about that the book is is really about people getting control people feeling empowered i think that's the most important thing is when you're struggling with a long COVID or chronic fatigue or any sort of chronic illness you feel that you've lost a bit of you and you can't do the things that you would like to do. That might mean you've had to give up, you've had to give up work. It might mean that you can't socialize. It might mean you can't do your hobbies. So the things that you enjoy have sort of been taken away from you and you've lost a bit of you. And I think the thing about this book is it's giving you ideas, suggestions, which allows you to take that back control and allows you to feel empowered and to think that you can make choices and decisions right now, today, that might make a difference to you and the future. And that's huge. I think when you've lost a little bit of that of yourself, to get some back, I think is massive. So what I'm hearing here, Charlotte, is that this book is not just for a sufferer of chronic fatigue. It's for someone who wants to prevent it. It's someone who wants to support someone they know and love with it, someone they may know who's at work with it. I mean, it really is a book that will catch all in terms of its audience. No, I, I, I hope so. I hope that parents could pick it up, that carers could pick it up, that anyone could pick it up. And because it's written as a story, it's easy to read. At the beginning, the introduction, it talks about my journey and how debilitating it can be and how tough it can be. And then it goes into the story. And I think that's really important because then whoever's reading it understands that I have been through it and I get it. And then you go with this beautiful story, which just helps people to understand maybe what they can do also to help someone who might be struggling with it or also to und- and also to appreciate you don't have a plaster you don't have a you know a something to show evidence to show how, what you'll feel or how you are you haven't broken your leg so you, it's only by your word of mouth by what you're telling people how you're feeling which is really difficult to explain fully because it's it's a complex complicated disease illness that varies from day to day almost so explaining it is difficult and and being believed is so important and i think that if anyone knows of anyone who's got it or struggling with it i think the most important thing is to feel that you are listened to and that you are believed i get that and i, I think that that is such a a big piece hearing how it is invisible and how it's not seen externally you can't as you say there's no reference point for for you to see someone who is struggling other than that they have shared with you that they're struggling tell me as much as you can or or want to you you mentioned that you shared your journey and how debilitating that was is that at the root of your purpose Definitely. The root of my purpose is to serve and help others. And I have had it twice. I had it in my 20s. I had it again uh, when I was 58 years ago. And then I've had long COVID. And during that time, I have done a lot of courses. I have um, learned so much 
applied everything I've learned and I'm in an amazing place now, but it's through hard work and determination coming from a place where when I was first had it in my 20s, I was working full time as a physiotherapist and I was uh, rowing four or five times a week. I was doing a postgrad course. I was newly married, had a full on social life. I was, you know, pushing every button possible and uh, and just suddenly thought, oh, I feel tired. And literally my life stopped overnight. And I couldn't get off the sofa. I couldn't move. I ended up actually having to go back to live with my parents and say that it was in bed probably two to three months. And all I could do was get up and shower. And that was about it. I couldn't come downstairs. I could hard, I couldn't even hardly lift my head off the pillow. Um, so obviously I couldn't work. I couldn't socialise. My husband came at weekends. I was back with my parents. A very, very tough time because it was I was back in the yuppie flu of, you know, just rest. And yeah, it was very, very hard because I had no idea whether I was going to get better. Was this was this my life from now on? Was I going to be bed bound? Was I going to stay in this state? Was I going to get better? Um, so emotionally and physically, a very difficult place to be. And then gradually I did with time. I remember the first day, actually, when I came downstairs and walked, I mean, walked around a little garden that my parents had and the absolute joy of being able to do that, of being able just to enjoy being outside and excitement of just doing those small steps and small steps when you're struggling are to be celebrated, however small they are, whether that's, you know, you've got up and had a shower or you've got dressed that day or you know the fact I was able to walk downstairs was huge and there's an element there that you shared that you're in an amazing place through hard work and determination now there's an irony that strikes me of it took hard work and determination to get through chronic fatigue explain that to me <laughs> I think it's true it's it's years of dedicating yourself to recovery and in my book I talk about a butterfly and I talk about that you know you start off as an egg when you're sort of first in that in that state of having chronic fatigue and you can't move and then gradually and, and then you gradually feed off a leaf and you and you eat it and you become a caterpillar and you start feeding off the leaf and the leaf is your information it's what you're pulling on it's what you're reading it's what you're listening to it's the courses that you go on and then you become a pupa, which is where you literally allow yourself to just put in place all that you've learned and adopt those things, whether that's through your what you're eating, whether that's through your mindset, whatever it happens to be, it's embracing it totally and being, and I was ruthless and determined to get better. And then you come out the other side as a butterfly and you're able to then fly and move on with your life and so I think a butterfly is such a lovely analogy of of thinking sort of the stages that you go through with it but yes I was I was determined and I was ruthless about about the decisions I made because you have to live and breathe that you will get better and have that determination that you will that you will recover and I'm assuming that there is no set pattern with this. It's very much down to the individual. There isn't a set pattern. It's very much down to the individual. I, I And people who get chronic fatigue all on COVID get it for different reasons. And people's symptoms are different. The similar similarity is that everyone has fatigue. And it's a it's not a fatigue that... You know, you go to bed and you wake up, you go to bed early and you wake up. It's just relentless and it doesn't go away and you have to manage it. But it, but the fatigue is a similarity and people may get it um, because of the lifestyles that they led up to the point that they've got it. And that could go right back to childhood, depending on illnesses that you had when you were younger. Um, also, you know, maybe 
I mean, I got it because I've had glandular fever, which is the Epsom Barr virus. So I, my immunity was down. When I was very small, I had a lot of antibiotics because uh, I had so much tonsillitis. And I pushed myself. I was a huge achiever, perfectionist. And that's a really common trait of people who go down with chronic fatigue because they drive themselves hard and they don't necessarily recognize the signs and they don't balance their life well. They just drive and push and put themselves into what I describe in the book as a fight and flight mode, the sympathetic mode where you're driving, your adrenalines are firing, and there's not enough time to recover. There's not enough time to put yourself into that rest and repair state, what we call the parasympathetic state, which allows your body to recover and have that downtime. Because you can't be in both at the same time. You can only be in one or the other. And your lovely metaphor of using the butterfly is brilliant and I love and I love it and and what I also want to sort of pinpoint is that moment of coming out of the pupa to emerging as a butterfly is a struggle it's a struggle for the butterfly it has to get stronger it has to force its way out right so is it is, is it a case again of using that metaphor of of nurturing yourself but also knowing that it is a case of determination and and willpower to help you through this no that's 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 a really good point actually yeah that's really true it is it's not you don't just suddenly emerge it's all lovely that's very true you have to be you have to push yourself through it and keep that sense of positivity and that focus on your end goal on your end result which is being a butterfly and i think you you have to sort of almost forget the journey you're going to go on, but go, but focus on that end and where your, you know, where your focus goes, your energy will flow, which I think is really true. And know that there's going to be ups and downs and know that it's going to be hard, but don't lose sight of where you're going. And I think that's really key. So taking you back to being at your parents and not being able to do anything other than showering and having your husband visit you at the weekends and and just barely lifting your head off the pillow. Can you share what it felt like to be in the garden specifically? I know you said that it was absolute joy, but I just want to see or hear what you felt from in terms of your senses. Yeah, do you know, I I can I can see it. I mean, as you've asked me that question, it was actually a sunny day. And I remember I was holding on to my my mum I'm walking around the garden with her and just it was glorious and the sun was shining and to have the warmth of the sun on your face, um, to be able to visualise and see the colours of the flowers that were out. I think I walked barefoot actually and having the grass, feeding grass under your feet and breathing in that fresh air, just taking in that, oh, that rather than that sort of stale environment of being in a bedroom for a while, for a long time, having that sort of first breath of fresh air, you know, inhaling it and drawing that in was oh, an experience just, you know, you t- we take it for granted of just walking outside, but when you haven't been outside for such a long time, the all your senses are literally on, on, on the sort of fire and alert and it really was very moving. And I, you know, although it was a long time ago, I can still feel it and see it now. It's almost like a reboot. Mm. Yeah, very much so. And I love the, the fact that you focused on the breath because, you know, it's a show it reminds us that we're alive, that, you know, our, our life starts when we take that first breath and it, it ends with our last breath. And it's very much a case of, when we do go outside, the body knows what to do. And this is something that was mentioned on a podcast a long time ago with, with uh, one of my guests. And he, he shared that as soon as you go outside, the first thing you instinctively do it without even recognizing is you take a big lung full of air. And you just shared that you, you'd remembered that doing that. So that was a very conscious memory. It wasn't an unconscious memory. It was really conscious of inhaling it savoring it and and taking that on board and we do forget to get out into nature so much and the fact that you had bare foot that you were in contact with the earth it's such a powerful thing 
Yeah, no, very much so. And and being out in fresh air and being out of nature is such a healing tool. Even if you can't, some people actually can't physically walk around, even just sitting outside, getting the sun on your face, getting some fresh air, doing some breathing. And breathing exercises are really, really key to getting the oxygen down to every cell in your body because we need oxygen to be able to produce energy. It is so crucial. And when you are you know, lying in bed, you tend to be sort of quite shallow breathing and being able to just remind yourself of the importance of taking those breaths and getting the oxygen down into your lungs, how much better that feels for you and your whole body. Um, yeah, is is really key. In fact, one of my characters, I mean, I've got in the book, when Angela, that's the main character, goes on her journey where she has these lovely magic marbles and each marble is a unit of energy. And she can lose marbles or she can gain marbles. So if she does things that take her energy away and puts herself into that fight flight mode, she will lose marbles. If she does things that put her into that rest and repair, allowing her body to recover, she will gain marbles. And one person, and she meets characters along the way that guide her and help her to understand how to get herself into that rest and repair state. And one character she meets is actually called Barbara Bellows. And she, she's glorious. And uh, she teaches her um, breathing techniques that will that will help her. And uh, there's a glorious illustration, uh, a friend of mine who's an illustrator called Lynn Redwoods, who's just fantastic, has brought my characters to life. I love that. And, and I love the way you describe it. Uh, Barbara Bello as being glorious. It, it, one thing, I love that. And, and it's very exciting to sort of, be taken on a journey we all love the, the the sense of magic and we love the but it's so relative it's so it's so applicable to our life even if we're not su uh, suffering from or had experience with chronic fatigue the, the way that you are helping people to understand how to rest and repair as well is crucial because we do take uh, very many things in our life for granted and having spoken to so many guests on the show in the past it's at those moments where they've had some kind of catalyst, which has shifted that taking something for granted to recognizing with huge gratitude what is going on. And that's what I want to sort of ask you now, the elements of purpose and gratitude, how does that fold into your work? I think gratitude is huge. I think, um, being grateful for what you have, being grateful for the, for the small things. And I think um, when you're in gratitude, when you're grateful for things, and that could be really small things, it could be the fact that the sun is shining, it could be the fact that, you know, you've got out of bed this morning, it could be the fact that someone's given you a phone call, it could be anything, however small or big. But when we are in the state of gratitude, that's putting ourselves into that lovely positive um, state of mind and we can't be negative. And that's, I think, very important and crucial that can be done every day so easily. And I really got into the habit of doing gratitudes every day. However small, however much you're struggling to appreciate small things um, are, is, I think, very key. And, and if you celebrate the small things, then gradually things will, will improve. And again, I've, uh, gratitude is something else I talk about in my book, and that's another lovely character she meets called Hannah Habit, actually. And Haba, Hannah Habit talks to Angela about habits, how forming good habits is so crucial. And one habit she talks about is, is gratitudes, and you can either write them down or you can just say them depending on on what you feel and and the more that you do them then they become a habit and they become sort of ingrained so when you're having those bad days if you just used to doing them then you can still keep doing them even on the bad days oh it's brilliant i can't wait to read the book rochelle it's going to be so exciting tell me about the focus on the book obviously is has been a huge chunk of your life for so long to get that out 
out there, what is it that you want to create as a an impact? What is it that you know your mission is done with this particular piece of work? That's a very good question. So when I started writing it, if I will answer that and I'll come, I will come come back to that in a minute. When I first started writing it, because of all the knowledge that I've gained, it's just if one person picked this book up and it changed one person's life, then my hours and hours of writing this book has been worth it, even if it just changes one person's life. Because that to me is so important. And I it was the whole purpose for writing the book was to serve and help others and to give them hope. And if I gave one person hope, then my you know, job was done. Having said that now, having written the book, it's about sharing this book to many people, seeing it everywhere, seeing people enjoy it, um, laugh about it, share it with their friends, and get a real sense of pleasure when they're struggling. And, you know, if I see comments or in a, in a WhatsApp or an email of how much it's changed for them and how, how much they've appreciated it would just be incredible. And what else? I, I would love to think that this book, uh, well, I, what I would really love is for this book maybe to become like a, almost like a, a film because the characters are so amazing and they're so visual that if it ended up if it ended up being sort of like a cartoon or a little film so that people could visualize it and see it then that would just be amazing and when you're in that throes and that deep despair then just you know seeing a short film that with these characters which are describing explaining would be um would be wonderful and um an audio book will be coming out every opportunity is there is there for people and for me to be able to, to spread the word of for people to help people to get out of that fight flight mode and into that parasympathetic state and that rest and repair state and I would, I just want to spread that word, that word, you know, that word far and wide, whether that's giving giving talks um, to reach as many people as possible. I think, you know, would be in, would be just a real dream. Well, I can see it happening. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> I can I can see the animation now. Having seen some sneak peeks at the characters I can totally see them alive and and bringing you know the, the world that you've created to to a shared vision so that we can all see the world that you've been living in and that you've been writing about and and it's been very real for you you know writing about it being so so em embodied into this book and then bringing it into public domain and in different ways as well. I know you're speaking about it now. It's going to be a written format, but having that visual connection as well, I think is huge. As you so beautifully described using your senses to, to really tap into what it means, what, what each of these characters are, are giving to Angela on her journey. It really is going to be something quite special. Well, I think so many people are visual learners. And to see the characters come to life and when they read a chapter and they might not be able to read the whole book, they might be too tired. I, I could hardly read when the last time I had it, my eye muscles were just struggling so much. But you could maybe pick up, pick the book up, read one chapter or even pick up the audio book and have the book in front of you to be able to visualise and see a character which would remind you about breath work or remind you about habits or remind you about different techniques. And um, I think it's so powerful. And then you remember it. If it's just words on a page, they can sort of, and when you've got chronic fatigue, your processing skills are poor. 
you can't retain information. You forget things really easy. You can't take things in. It's impossible. But if you have something in, in front of you, which is a picture that you can hold in that, hold in your mind, I feel is so powerful. I mean, one of the characters she meets is glorious. He's called Henry Happy. And he's just a generally gorgeous. I mean, Lynn, who drew this originally, funny enough, I wanted to draw it as a sort of Rastafarian. Anyway, young Rastafarian. And then she came back, she said, look, I didn't do what you asked her. I thought this was so much better. And he's ended up being a, a bald, elderly man dancing. But he's glorious. He's just, he makes you smile. And Lynn said to me, Charlotte, I know it's not what you wanted, but is this all right? And I said, I love it. I absolutely love it. You know, and smiling is so important. Um, and even if you don't feel like smiling just in the morning, you know, just lifting the corners of your mouth into that smile, you know, is it can just change your whole feeling and your whole senses. And I think doing the illustrations and for people to hold on to those pictures and there's 12 characters um, can be really key rather than just words and more words on a page. Um, time off time and I think that this will bring it to life and what else has been brought to life for this journey over the last few months that you've been writing or years even well I think was I I'm actually really grateful to have had it and I know it's been a very tough experience and don't you know having chronic fatigue long COVID is really hard and really tough but I'm Honestly, hand on heart, I know this might sound surprising and shocking to some people who might at the beginning of their journey, but what a journey I've been on. And I'm and I'm so lucky and grateful to have a massive toolkit now. I've learned a lot about myself. Um, I became a nutritionist. I, I did some nutrition work and then qualified as a nutritionist. I've then done a lot of psychology programs um, to look into my my mindset and what role was that having not only obviously the physical what I was eating and but also what what was I telling myself and has been huge so I'm really grateful that I've had a chance to stop and regroup and look at what I'm doing and and all these tools that I've gathered will help me for the rest of my life not just recovery through this but but now moving forwards and your beliefs, I think, are very powerful. So what you say to yourself and what you what you are saying to yourself are all sort of beliefs that are that you from when you were very young, up to the age of sort of five or seven, to you know, to get love and to get what you needed. Um, and that safety and love, but we don't need to hold on to the beliefs and we keep playing them out and and just don't not let them have the power acknowledging that they're moving on it's been fundamental another another huge point in moving forwards and recovery so yeah I've been on this incredible journey and learnt so much about myself and have a toolkit to have forever so do you think that in some way the body is gifting you chronic fatigue to actually wake up <laughs> Yeah, I think I think when people go down with any illness, it's your body knocking on the door going, you're not listening to me. I'm giving you signs and you're ignoring me and I'm going to make you stop until you actually wake up. And uh, and I think your body is incredible at giving you these signs. But we I think if we're busy, which I said I was, uh, you know, very busy, is that we ignore it. Because we're we're in that sort of I've got to do this and I've got to run and I've got you know and we don't stop, take stock and really listen to what our needs are, our true needs are. So these gorgeous, glorious, fabulous, joyous characters, these twelve <laughs> characters, will help you to recognise all the signs. Yes, exactly. They will they will help you to recognise the signs. They will help you to be aware. Maybe when you're when you're not. I mean. People can think they're resting and think, oh, I've got no energy, I'm resting. And actually, but they're not. They're resting in a state of putting themselves into that fight and flight. They might be sitting with a cup of coffee and a sticky bun and 
And that's already putting their body into the fight flight because it creates crazy information. And then you might watch something on telly that gets you all agitated and you're back in that fight, flight, 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 adrenal stage. So each the characters are there to remind you and to help and guide you to what you are, what you're thinking, but what you're eating and and getting yourself into that beautiful rest and repair state. Well, I feel like they are part of you now and that, you know, you, wherever you go, the 13 people will always turn up. <laughs> yes, they're, yeah, they are. They're on my shoulder. They're with me. They're, every character is with me every day. Um, and when I, you know, we're all human. And when I, you know, feel myself pushing too hard, it's I get a little knock on it and I get one character going, you know, I need to do, you know, can you do a bit of meditation, a bit of breath work? And they're there. You know, in their glorious state, and I go, okay, I'm listening. I get you now. So, anybody who would like to get hold of the book or reach out and connect with you and find out more about the nutrition work that will how where, how to reach out and get you to come and speak for them, what was the best way for them to reach out for you? Um, I'm on Charlotte Jones. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I happily you know, give my email, um, Charlotte underscore e underscore Jones at yahoo.co.uk. Isn't it? Oh, oh, I'm also on Instagram under nutrition two, as in the number two energize. So three ways that um, you can reach out to me. Amazing. Well, they'll all go in the show notes. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for bringing what is a challenging topic to, to life in a fun and informative and inspirational way. It really has been a delightful conversation, Charlotte. So thank you. Do you have some parting words for the listener, please? Thank you, Amy, first of all, for um, inviting me on this on this podcast and for allowing me to share my story. And my parting word is never give up hope. Never give up your dreams. Never give up the opportunity of thinking, you know, you will get there, you will recover and believe and just take that belief into yourself and feel empowered and take take control yourself. How has this conversation had an impact on you? What value have you received from tuning in? What are your reflections with actions? Please take a moment to leave me an Apple podcast or Spotify review sharing how Focus on Why has made a difference to you today. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. To keep it going, simply connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter or join the Focus on Why Facebook group. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.